Is the World Health Organization mishandling the worldwide response to the coronavirus? As the UN agency warns that the window to contain the outbreak is narrowing, how should the WHO stop the spread? This is Inside Story. Hello there and welcome to the program. I'm Nastasia Tay. Now, more and more countries are reporting cases of the coronavirus. The World Health Organization is worried that some of the new infections appear to have no direct link to China, where the outbreak was first reported in December. New deaths have now been reported in Iran and Italy. In South Korea, the number of infections more than doubled on Saturday to 433. Many of them are members of a religious group. WHO experts in China have finally now been given permission to visit Wuhan, the epicenter of the outbreak. The head of the WHO is warning that the window of opportunity to contain the virus globally is narrowing. Although the total number of cases outside China remains relatively small, we're concerned about the number of cases with no clear epidemiological link, such as travel history to China or contact with a confirmed case. We are especially concerned about the increase in cases in the Islamic Republic of Iran. Well, let's take a quick look at just how this crisis has unfolded. Now, on the final day of last year, China's government alerted the World Health Organization about several cases of an unknown virus in the city of Wuhan, the capital of Hubei province. A week later, the new strain of coronavirus was identified, and then a few days after that, the first fatality was reported. By late January, more than 600 Chinese people were infected. A quarantine was imposed on Wuhan and the 11 million people who live there. But the WHO said the outbreak wasn't a public emergency, with no evidence of human-to-human -human transmission outside China. It wasn't until the end of the month that a global emergency was declared. By then, 213 people had died, and almost 10,000 were infected. Fast forward to mid-February, and the virus continues to spread around the world. The number of infections tops 66,000, partly due to a change in how doctors in China identify new cases. Well, let's now take a look at the virus tracker. Johns Hopkins University in the United States is monitoring the spread of the outbreak worldwide. The rate of infection appears to be falling, but the total number continues to rise. As of Saturday, 22nd February, almost 78,000 people have the virus, the vast majority of those in China. At least 2,300 people have now died so far. Well, let's now bring in our guests. From Geneva, we have Dr. Margaret Harris. She's a spokeswoman for the World Health Organization. In Houston, Dr. Peter Hotez. He's dean for the National School of Tropical Medicine at the Baylor College of Medicine. And in Liverpool, we have Dr. Mohamed Munir. He is a lecturer in biomedicine at Lancaster University. Thank you all for, all for joining us on the program. So, Dr. Hotez, I want to start with you, and I want to ask you about these dots that we've been looking at on this map. Because they're worrying, not necessarily because of their size, but because of where they're located. So not necessarily a direct link now to Wuhan or China. We're seeing travelers from Iran now turning up in Lebanon and, and Canada testing positive for the virus. Are we now in a new stage of contagion here? Well, it's certainly a possibility. And first of all, thank you for having me on. Uh, and, and this is what uh, Dr. Tedros and the World Health Organization has been worried about and the reason they called a public health emergency of international concern because as as this unfolded it became clear that this virus does have pandemic potential because of its of its easy transmissibility so the fact now that we're seeing clusters of cases now in Korea and South Korea in Iran in Singapore uh, it doesn't mean that we're seeing sustained viral transmission going on at this point but it looks like we could be headed there. And that would mean that we're, what, what we've been talking about is an epidemic mostly confined to central China, to Hubei province, and, and some of the other provinces in China now could emerge into a global uh, uh, pandemic. And, and uh, this, is, uh, this is cause for great concern, especially when you talk about nations where health systems are not so strong. Uh, so I do worry about 
uh, places like Iran. I also worry about other countries in the Middle East. I think this could be this could gain a foothold in the Middle East, mm -hmm. uh, which would cause uh, places like Yemen, uh, Syria, Iraq. This would be a, a catastrophe, of course, uh, and as well as uh, elsewhere in Africa and Asia. So uh, the next few weeks are going to be very important to see whether this emerges or whether there is some seasonality to this in the northern hemisphere, which mm -hmm. will help things die down. But of course, we have no evidence for that. So uh, we'll see how this unfolds. Well, clearly the coronavirus is spreading. And I do want to take a look at what the WHO has been specifically saying about it as time goes on. And the response has obviously shifted from the director general as it spread. Let's take a listen to what he's had to say. I'm not declaring a public health emergency of international concern today. As it was yesterday, the emergency committee was divided over whether the outbreak of novel coronavirus represents a fig or not. I'm declaring a public health emergency of international concern over the global outbreak of novel coronavirus. The main reason for this declaration is not because of what is happening in China, but because of what is happening in other countries. Although the window of opportunity is narrowing to contain the outbreak, we still have a chance to contain it. But while doing that, we have to prepare at the same time for any eventualities, because this outbreak could go any direction. It could even be messy. Well, overall, it sounds like the tone there was, has been one of cautious optimism. But now we're hearing this word messy. I mean, that soundbite was just from yesterday. And looking at the map of the spread and looking at the numbers, I mean, it looks like it's already messy. Dr. Harris, can we contain it? Well, China's given us a head start. So they've given us seven weeks. And some of the modelling suggested, I mean, it's been mostly in China for seven weeks. Most of the modelling suggests they really gave us two weeks to prepare. Now, yes, those two weeks have essentially passed. But in that time, countries around the world have been preparing, especially, I, I noticed Professor Hotez quite rightly mentioned the concern about fragile health systems. And a lot of our work has been to work with um, the ministries of health in, in the countries that we have identified as particularly fragile and made sure that things like laboratory services are available, that they have the test and can do the test, but also that they have the means to protect their health staff and that the training and provision of people is stepped up. So, yes, um, it, 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 it is a period where the opportunity is narrowing, but the work has already been going on for many weeks to get the world prepared. Dr. Harris, you say that China has given you a head start. What do you mean by that specifically? Well, they worked intensively to, to really contain the virus. And even though we now are seeing spread to a, a considerable number of other countries, for most of the time, it really was within China. So 99% of cases were within China. It's really only this week that we've seen the kind of spread that suggests that indeed that window of opportunity has narrowed. Mm -hmm. Well, there has been some criticism of the amount of time that it took to declare a global public health emergency. And I know the emergency committee who initially were advising on it were split 50-50, but Dr. Tedros himself could have overruled them. He was ultimately the man who decided. So, Dr. Munir, let me ask you, was he right to wait? Well, I think there are a few things important to understand before we reach to that conclusion is that what is a public health emergency? What would it bring into the whole picture? Um, although the public health emergency was, um, um, I don't know whether that was intentional, unintentional or influenced, was significantly late than it should in principle would have been put in place. But the major question really comes in that after putting public health emergency, what those measures have been put in place, especially in vulnerable countries or country with the thin uh, infrastructure, what efforts have been made really to emphasize onto the fact that the virus is contagious, is spreading a lot more uh, at, at a broader scale than any other virus in the recent history we have seen. I mean, within two months, we have seen over 73,000 people already been infected. I know all been, or majority of them has been in China. 
but still now the number is increasing significantly in other countries. So I think uh, having public health emergency or not having public health emergency may not be a crucial point, but the point is that after having public health emergency, what significant uh, changes has been put in place mm -hmm. that can help to contain the infection. Well, one of the big measures that was taken initially was by China, and that was the quarantine of Wuhan. I mean, that's the largest quarantine in human history. But by my understanding, there's little scientific evidence that such large-scale quarantines actually work. And I do realize that some experts have said that it's actually in violation of WHO guidelines. So, Dr. Hotez, I want to ask, the WHO was quite vocal in its praise of the Chinese government here. Was it the right call? Well, you know, as you know, as a vaccine scientist and pediatrician researcher, pediatrician scientist, I've been watching this now for over 30 years uh, in terms of uh, epidemics or pandemics. And I think it's important also to emphasize a number of things that have gone right uh, this time compared to, say, what happened with SARS in 2002, 2003. Remember, if you don't have a vaccine in hand, you're essentially fighting a highly transmissible agent with one hand tied behind your back. Mm -hmm. These vi highly transmissible viruses set you up to make you look bad. And even despite that, I think there's a lot that's gone right. Look, um, one of the things, we're, we develop vaccines. We actually have two coronavirus vaccines that we're developing. One of the really impressive things coming out of China was the flow of information about the virus. I mean, if you think about it, we're only talking a few weeks. We already have the virus isolated. We have the full genetic code of the virus. We know what receptor the virus binds to uh, in the lungs. We hit the ground running, as did other groups, in terms of uh, developing new vaccine concepts, developing antiviral drugs. That has gone extraordinarily well, and the mm -hmm. Chinese scientists have been extremely transparent about getting their information up uh, on a preprint server called BioArchive. That's gone very well. Uh, in terms of how you deal with a highly transmissible uh, agent, uh, this this was a tough call that chi the Chinese had to make, and uh, and it's it's actually a pretty remarkable by this time that this virus is not pervasive across uh, the nation of China. That in fact it's still largely uh, contained within uh, Wuhan. I'm not mm -hmm. endorsing some of the draconian measures that they took, but I think, you know, again, the Chinese have done the best they could do given the limited options that there's, that unfortunately, we can have a longer discussion about this. <laughs> unfortunately, we're still relying on 14th century technologies, which is what quarantine is or passive antibody transfer is what we did in the 1918 flu pandemic. We can do better than that in terms of preparing for new technologies. But given what they had to work with, uh, things have gone r as well as I think they could have by this point. Dr. Harris, I see you nodding there. And I, I want to ask you, because the WHO has praised the quarantine, but at the same time, the WHO also decided not to impose travel restrictions. And I'm looking at a, an advisory here from the WHO that's dated January 27th, and it says... The WHO advises against the application of any restrictions of international traffic based on the information currently available. And that didn't change after the declaration of a public health emergency either. I, I see a number of countries ignored that and did it anyway. But can you talk us through the thinking here? Why not impose travel restrictions? Well, so actually, we didn't praise quarantine as such. What we were praising was exactly what Professor Hotez has identified, excellent provision of data, early a provision of the information that allowed the scientists around the world to look at this virus, to understand its genetics, to develop testing and, and exactly have candidates for vaccines. And that's never happened before in the history of an outbreak, of the speed with which all of this has been done. So this is where we, uh, just as Professor Hotez has said, we were very um, pleased and happy to see that this kind of information flow, which is one of the reasons we have things like international health regulations and where we ask our member states to, to get together and share data and share information. So exactly so that everybody who's got the expertise can get together and try to help. Now, on the travel and trade restrictions, this was very much something that caused major problems during the SARS outbreak. The world shut down on Hong Kong and China, and it became very difficult for anybody to, to get in and help, and it, and it destroyed economies. It, it, it sowed terrible panic and fear. I'm actually from Hong Kong. I was living there at the time. The shelves were stripped bare. I see 
exactly the same thing happened this time. So even though we, and, and one of the reasons we emphasize do not panic in terms of travel and trade restrictions, it seems that that, that natural human, that, that human reflex to mm. panic, the minute we say, yes, this is serious, still kicked in. Well, Dr. Harris, let me ask you then, because there has been a lot of speculation around the politics of this, and there was a lot of talk in China about a clampdown on information about the spread of the virus and the immediate aftermath of, of it emerging. Um, and China's obviously a hugely important country, also for the WHO, not only as a current donor, but a future donor, and also as a partner working together to fight global health problems in the future. So clearly a very important, critical relationship to maintain. So let me ask you straight out then, has the importance of that relationship affected any kind of the WHO's response to the coronavirus? I can tell you absolutely honestly, no. We have 192 member states and they all have equal status. China does represent one fifth of the world's people. So they do represent a huge chunk of the human uh, population. Mm. But in terms of whether we say one member state's more than important than another, no. We do work with everyone and we do strive to keep as much openness and as much uh, as, as clear and open a relationship with all mm. member states. Do remember in the early stages of any outbreak, people just don't know what's going on. and and. Sometimes people aren't sure that they've really got an outbreak on their hands. They actually notified us on 31st of December. We're now seeing that there probably were cases earlier, but with any outbreak, what is, a, in, in retrospect, clearly was perhaps a cluster of cases is not necessarily obvious at mm -hmm. the time. Well, in terms of timing, Dr. Harris, we've also seen it take some time to get a WHO team of experts into the country, an advanced team, and then a team of experts that's now on the ground and has only just been given permission to go to Wuhan. Why has it taken so long? With Wuhan particularly, there, there were concerns that everybody there was so extremely overstretched that sending a mission who, how these missions work is you sit down with your counterparts in the area and you don't exactly subject them to a grilling, but you ask them to provide them with all the information they've got available on their particular area. So you're asking somebody who is actually trying to deal with thousands of people, people that they need to care for, to mm. sit down and take a day off and spend time with you. Sure. Now, things, things seem to have settled down a bit in Wuhan. It has been possible. And so the team is now in there. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the really critical parts of all of this has been testing for the coronavirus, right? And I see um, that in a number of places, it does seem that people are having up to six negative tests before then testing positive. And Dr. Li Wenliang, the, the Chinese doctor who initially raised the alarm, he died after testing negative multiple times and then testing positive. And now we're seeing evacuees from the Diamond Princess, the cruise ship, who initially tested negative, going home and then testing positive there. So let me ask you, Dr. Munir, is there something wrong with the test? Should we be worried about that? Uh, well, one thing is important that, as uh, uh, the two guests has been saying, that the China has provided information very early in time. And those uh, information and the data has been used to uh, sort of define the diagnosis diagnostic assays in the beginning. But for having a highly sensitive diagnostic assay and the reliable one, as in the emerging phase of this outbreak, we carry on revising that to see if it can catch up all those uh, uh, mutations or anything comes in. So down the track of this um, uh, optimization and uh, customization, there have been few changes into the diagnostic assay. But I think whatever has been um, available throughout the scientific community is what mm. we can offer at this moment and up to the mark. Dr. Hotez, let me throw that to you because it seems that Hubei province gave up on the test and then started diagnosing people based on symptoms rather than actual test results. And that's when we saw that huge spike in numbers. So is there an argument that everyone should be doing the same? Well, you know, remember, uh, developing diagnostics for respiratory infections is not trivial. Uh, we, we, we're a bit behind in all of our diagnostic capabilities for respiratory infections, and that's why the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation has, has invested a huge amount of uh, uh, funds to uh, improve our diagnostics. So, so I think what the problem that you saw 
in uh, Wuhan is not too different from any respiratory diagnostic. That's a matter, and that's the question of sensitivity uh, in order to be able to the detect the virus early on in the infection, because presumably there are not a lot of virus particles around uh, for you to easily diagnose it. Yeah. So this is not actually unusual for somebody to test negative early on. And then as the infection worsens, as the viral load accumulates, then it becomes positive. We've seen this scene play out over and over again. Um, and so that's a problem. You know, again, when this is a brand new infectious mm -hmm. disease agent and trying to get your arms around it when you don't really know the mode of transmission. There's a lot of, we still don't know the mode of transmission in detail. We we think it's through droplet contact, but there may be airborne transmission. There may even be fecal oral transmission. Uh, and this takes time. But remember, I think it's really important to keep this time frame in perspective. We're talking just a few weeks and we're already wondering whether our diagnostic test is sensitive enough and specific enough compared to any other uh, uh, epidemic of pandemic potential, uh, the amount of information we're learning. So it's it's easy to see how uh, the chi Chinese public health authorities might go back and forth in terms of their sure. diagnostic criteria, whether they use the diagnostic test, whether they use the clinical test, going back and forth. These are these are stumbling blocks uh, to be expected, mm -hmm. uh, and and uh, and I think we're slowly getting our arms around it, but it's still going to take a few weeks to really sort everything out. Sure. I do want to take a bit of a step back here, and um, because the WHO has had to grapple with a number of epidemics and pandemics, um, Ebola, swine flu, and there was a lot of criticism, particularly with Ebola, about a very slow bureaucratic response that Dr. Tedros himself acknowledged. And when he was elected, he was elected on a platform of saying that he was going to make some pretty big changes and reforms at the WHO. So let me ask you then, Dr. Harris, what's changed at the WHO since Ebola? It's changed extraordinarily, and I was de there at the time. Um, I, I was one of the people brought in in 2014 when WHO did step up, and we were criticised for stepping up late. That was in August 2014. What WHO was then was essentially a scientific standards um, setting body that looked at things like an epidemic coming in and what to do, but wasn't really operational. So now the difference is that we have set up an entire organization within the organization called the, the Emergencies Program. And we, we respond operationally as well as scientifically to all emergencies. And, and even scientifically, we operate on a emergency footing. So for instance, we brought um, all the researchers, all the scientists from around the world together two weeks ago as an emergency to ask them, what can we do right now? What science can we do right now? What do we have to accelerate? What are the big priorities? And we got our Chinese colleagues who couldn't join us because they're actually dealing with this massive outbreak sure. uh, to, to join us. And we said, so what are your big asks? And it's interesting that we've mentioned diagnostics because that was their first ask. Mm -hmm. They wanted a test that could be point of care. That means whether you're in a clinic or you know, a nurse station or at the bedside, you could do the test right away and confirm whether or not somebody had coronavirus. And of course, the other thing everybody wants is acceleration on understanding which um, therapeutics, which drugs, which medicines might help um, limit this disease or stop this disease. And of course, the other one is the vaccine. Of course, and moving forward, there's going to be a, a huge amount of demand for resources, particularly in fragile health systems, as we've been talking about. Dr. Munir, let me ask you, how does this play out? We need something like $675 million to respond um, just until April 2020, and, and obviously we're seeing the coronavirus spread. Um, where do we go from here? Uh, well, developing vaccines and uh, uh, much more sensitive and continuously improved assays are really uh, uh, challenges, I mean, for these kind of infections. And vaccine is... Uh, always been with its own complication. I mean, we, we do know that uh, through SAPI and through um, Gates Foundation, a lot of money has been allocated for development of the vaccines. But this is, vaccine is really a long-term solution, what we're looking on. I mean, we, even with the availability of the latest technologies, what we are looking on mm. is like eight to 10 months, potentially in an emergency situation. So therefore, I don't really see that a vaccine could be an immediate solution. 
um, because once you establish a vaccine, that is uh, probably the easiest part. But then it comes to preclinical pre and clinical stages where most of the time is used. At this moment, a priority should be on to the infrastructure development in terms of sensitive diagnostic assays and really to uh, refurbish the um, uh, countries, those are having mm. uh, a poor infrastructure to really emphasize that if there is any threat approaching to those countries, they would be capable to really diagnose and isolate those uh, vulnerable or the positive cases so that disease transmission can be intervened. Sure. So this is ultimately about strengthening health systems more broadly across the world. And obviously, and we'll continue watching this very, very closely indeed. Um, I'd like to thank all of our guests. That's Margaret Harris, Peter Hotez and Mohamed Munir. Thank you to you all. And thank you too for watching. You can see the program again anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, do go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. And you can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Nastasia Tay, and the whole team here in Doha, bye for now.